So let's see if we get the slides up here. Is one? There we go. You can tweet at that. So the year is 1982, and you, I'd like you to imagine, are what they called an MIS director at that time. Stood for Manager of Information Services, but information then was all data. All data was big then, and all data was in a large computer. And you're working for a large organization, uh, XYZ Megacorp, let's say. And in 1982, something called the IBM PC showed up in companies. Before that, personal computers had actually been around for quite a long time. The earliest ones actually came out in the 60s. Famously, Apple and Radio Shack and Sinclair and Osborne, lots of different personal computers that showed up, Atari, None of them were major brand names at the time. Most of them are gone now. And you're asked, as an MIS director at a, at a large company, are you going to let more of these PCs into your organization? And you're going to say no. And you're going to say no because personal computer, personal computing is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. You, it's like personal steamship or personal cruise ship, like the one out here, or, or, or personal power plant. It's something only, computing was something only big organizations did. It was exclusively a corporate power. People didn't have that. Oh, it's some hobbyist things. You could do a little programming, you could run a few little games, but nothing big, nothing serious. And so, You'd say, no, you're not, we're not going to get any more of these in here. They cost too much. We've already got a lot of terminals on everybody's desk. Tell you what, a year or two later, they'd say, well, you know what? We can, you can put an attachment or a 3Com card in the back of that thing. They'd had a, a back plane, they called it, where you could stick a slot of card in there and say, you know what? You can fake being an IBM 3270 display terminal or a digital VT100 or 200 dumb terminal. That's what they were called. And you could do serious computing on the corporate mainframe where, you know, in the back room you have people doing punch cards, you have people writing COBOL, you have teams of people. You're not going to do any personal computing here. And within two or three or four years, what happened? Not only did computing become personal worldwide and there were PCs everywhere and everybody was running in a corporation on everybody's desk, a, a, an IBM compatible personal computer, but they're running tens of thousands of programs, all of which liberated the inherent creativity of individual human beings. What happened was a corporate power became personal. We could do more with spreadsheets and word processing. Word processing before that was run by one company called Wang. You got a big $50,000 machine and that was your word processor. And it was a separate thing from the mainframe. So, the thing we forget, we, think, we tend to think technology makes progress. No, people make progress by taking over the technology that was formerly business to business alone. So, now let's jump forward to 1995. In 1995, the internet appeared in a serious way for the first time. Before that, the internet was around. Everybody knew, they'd heard of the internet, um, but it was confined to uh, not only lar a few large companies, but really to research organizations, to the military, um, uh, to, to high energy physics and things like that. Uh, it was not something you and I had. But then all of a sudden out came the, um, the domain name system. You could buy a domain name. You could now um, uh, get a browser. You had ISPs, Internet Service Providers. The Internet we know today really was born in 1995 with ISPs. With email, if you had a domain name, you could have your first name at domainnamelastname.com. Nobody owned email. Nobody owned the Internet. Nobody owned any of that. And because of that, because nobody owned this thing, and because the protocols it used were open, suddenly everybody could use it. Now, you're an IT manager again this time. You're called an IT manager at a large organization or a government, a government organization. And if you're asked, are you going to let this internet thing into your organization? You're going to say no. You're going to say no because you already have networking. You have secure networking. You buy it from a large company. 
you have, you, you have Novell, you have 3Com, you have these other serious kinds of networking, and the idea of personal networking, of people, individual people having the power to network was just as crazy as it was for people to do computing 10 or 15 years earlier. But what happened over the next several years was the dot-com boom. And all of a sudden, all of us had not only the power to, um, to compute, and, but to communicate worldwide at a cost that wanted to be zero. And we're, we were using a system that, that if it would, had been left up, all due respect to the phone companies and to the cable companies, never would have happened because billing wasn't built into it. There was no, there was no billing built into the internet. The internet is, a, is based on protocols, and protocols are nothing more than manners. You know, grazie, prego, hello, how are you, handshake. This is, those are protocols. That's all computers are doing at a distance over the internet. That's what defines the internet that we know. It's just protocols, it's just agreements. So, what, so now we have these two things. We have computing and we have communications, global networking, available to individual human beings, and they're doing more with it than companies are. And that's good for the companies, and it's good for the governments, and it's good for the large organizations because those are composed of people, and they have people for customers. And so what we need to know here is that, again, this is not a technological revolution, it's a human revolution, and it's happening at the individual level. And we can look back on this and say, yeah, that seems fairly obvious, but now let's jump forward to 2008. In, two, in 2008, the smartphone had come out, first with Apple and then uh, with Android. And the, and the tablets are starting to show up with the iPad and then later with the Android tablets. And what happened here? All of a sudden, all of us had this computing power and this communication power in our pockets, and it became very personal with these things that were called smart and went in our pockets. So it, again, you're an IT manager at a large organization, and you're asked, are you going to let people bring their own devices, what we now call BYOD? And most of you would say no, because we, we have Blackberries. We're going to give you Blackberries. You know, Blackberries work with our corporate um, uh, systems like uh, Microsoft Exchange. We have a few programs that run on them. They're smart enough. You know, you can you bring in your iPhone if you want, but you're not going to use it for a serious corporate work because they're not really secure. They're too personal. So what happens by two or three years after that? The big companies, your companies, are now writing programs for your employees to run on their iPads and their iPhones and their Androids. Because what happened? again, is that you as individual people could do far more with the power of computing and communication in your pocket than the companies could, and it was good for the companies, and the companies got adjusted to it. So now, let's jump forward to this present, 2013, right now. What happened before with computing and with communications and with portability is now about to happen with data. At this moment in time, if you read the business sections of newspapers and if you're following technology, you're going to hear about two things that big companies do and only big companies can do. Just like only big companies can run mainframes and only big companies can run networks. One is big data and the other is the cloud. Okay, and big data happens in the cloud and, there's a, uh, and now you're an IT manager again in today's time and you are asked are you going to take this big data that you've got in your clouds that you've collected about individuals, about your employees in HR and every other place, and you've collected about um, your customers, and are you going to let them have it in a form they can use? The last panel was about quantified self. One of the problems they went over in that panel was that all of these quantified self companies Fitbit and Digifit and the rest of them, they're all siloing that data. Try and get it out of them. Try to integrate that data. Can you do it? No, you can't because it's the same problem we had before the PC got standardized, before we had the internet. We're in that state before all of a sudden we are going to be able to do more with that data than they can. 
Any one of us can do far more with our quantified self data or any data in the world that has anything to do with us than the companies can. The tools are only beginning to appear so far. Now, what happened before with, um, with computing was we hijacked, we took over a term that had been a corporate term. Computing, we did it with networking. We're doing it, we did it with voice and telephony, and now we're going to do it with data. So I want to show you something. This is a, um, this is my camera, which I've been carrying around here. And on the bottom of it is a uh, QR code. And this, in fact, is the QR code, the very same one. And for those of you with a scanner on your phone, I invite you to hold it up at the, at the screen here, like with your phone. Like, there's a thing in the U.S. we call scan and scram. What you do is you take your phone into a store, and then you scan something, and then you find out that Amazon's got it cheaper, and then you scram out of the store, right? So you use that same thing, and you scan this and see what it says. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is one of the, the Internet of Things that we're talking about now. You hear about the Internet of Things. Even with the Internet of Things, there's an assumption that only the big companies can do something with the Internet of Things. But this is my thing, and this has a cloud. And if you look at that, which is, I shot that with my iPhone on this, which is a scan of something else, but it's, it's, that's a nice thing about the QR code. By the way, nobody owns that. It's open source. QR codes are invented by a company in Japan to track uh, parts for, for cars. But the cool thing about um, QR codes is that anybody can use them. So they're completely free to be used. So if you scan that, what you're going to see is this. This is Doc Searle's camera. Please text or call my phone number. So the, and I'm going to go back to the code for a second. Um, in part because I don't want people to see my phone number, I just realized. So, <laughs> but in any case, this is the other thing that's on here. But the point here is that my device, my phone, has its own cloud, and I own that cloud. Now, there is in, for the, uh, in, in business something called CRM, for Customer Relationship Management. It's an 18 billion, maybe a 20 billion dollar business worldwide. It's the business by which by the, 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 the system by which companies imagine that they have relationships with customers. They really don't. All the, cu all the uh, customer relationship management companies, um, IBM and SAP and uh, Salesforce and uh, Microsoft Dynamics, are B2B businesses. They're selling ways for companies to set up call centers and do marketing. Right. But they all do it differently. That's one of the reasons we have a zillion different password and login combinations and so forth. So what's, what's, what's happening is that with a, a QR code like this on my phone, with its personal cloud, is I have a window into like a filing cabinet of documents that I can put in there about my camera. I can create, in addition to the, uh, the link that, um, that goes to the cloud for that thing that says this is mine, I can put anything I want in there. There's no limit to it. And there's an operating system for it already. It's called Cloud OS. It's open source. It was designed by a guy named Phil Windley at a company called Kinetics in Salt Lake City. They're one of a number of companies in a community we call VRM for Vendor Relationship Management. It's the customer side counterpart of customer relationship management. The idea is that we'll be able to come up with the tools that make us both independent and better able to engage with companies. So imagine if Canon shipped that camera with the QR code on it, and on that QR code, or behind that QR code, was the cloud for that camera, and I'm buying the cloud along with the camera itself. Or any of these quantified self things, the, the Fitbit thing that goes in your pocket, or the Nike thing that goes in your shoe, or any of the other, any um, app that does quantified self, like, like Moves, I use that one, that had a QR code on it that I could read, when I buy the product, I get that, cab that filing cabinet with it, and it's mine. And if I sell it, it can go with them too. And both the company and I can put whatever I want into there. And so for the first time with a code like this, we have a way to have a genuine relationship between customers and companies. And so I'm saying this to the, to the, to the CRM companies out there. We have the VRM. 
I'm starting to get the VRM tools for doing this. Now, you might notice that I'm wearing this thing here. It's a, there's a company called Emmet Global. They're another VRM development company that voluntarily just made this thing for a new nonprofit called Customer Commons that just came up in the last year. And if you scan that one, and I see some of you have, but you're going to see this. You know, I wear this pin to let you know I don't consent to you mining my data. The, the idea behind this was a development that's happening, I guess, in the various places in the world, but I know it's happening in the U.S., where mannequins in a store have cameras in their eyes that follow you around and can identify you and then use that facial recognition and so forth to go marketing at you. There's an enormous amount of privacy invasion that's going on in the world right now, and we need a way to signal the companies and the processes that are invading our privacy, that are looking inside our clothes almost, almost that we do not consent to that. That's not something we want. And so this is a, an early prototype of something that can be done with that. Now, both of the, the, the VRM development community has like a hundred different uh, companies and open source development efforts that are going on at the same time. They're going on all over the world. Um, Adriana Lucas, who was up here earlier, led the VRM uh, hub meetings in the UK several years ago and did a very good job with it. There's a lot of development going on in the UK, here in Italy, in, um, in France, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US. Um, it's a worldwide phenomenon. But the thing that's emerged in just the last few months and it's not, I have a book out that called The Intention Economy When Customers Take Charge, which is a successor to the Clue Train Manifesto. For those of you who, uh, who like Clue Train, go ahead and buy that book. Um, but in it, I don't describe this, which is Personal Clouds, the title of my talk today about Personal Clouds. Already, there's a logo for this. There's a, a, a bunch of meetups that have already happened, and are, there's a growing um, community of people that are talking about Personal Clouds. What happened with this is once again a corporate term, the cloud, got hijacked by people working on personal solutions. So all of that stuff I just showed you that can happen with QR codes, and it's just one thing you can do in a personal cloud, is now, um, is now happening, um, is now happening in, a, in a single area that we can all talk about as a single thing that belongs to you and me. So in the next few years, the state of the net is going to be one in which we all are as much in charge of our data as we have became in charge of our computing in the 1980s and in our networking in the 1990s and in portability in the late aughts after, after 2007. There's an enormous amount to talk about here, but I'm going to leave you hanging because my time's up and I need to yield it the floor to the next speaker. So we'll take Q&A if we still have time and Paolo thinks we still have time. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly cheating because I'll be chairing the panel, but it was a question I was going to ask Doc about the cloud and how confusing that word is, and I, I still find it confusing. And when you said these different QR codes will have clouds associated with them, I found myself confused again as to whether these are multiple clouds, a single space, multiple spaces that act like a single, you know, it's hard dealing with the virtual world, you know, because we, the world should be full of things that are concrete, and the problem with the internet is it's not. And the problem with, um, with machine intelligence, especially when it gets abstracted away, is that it's not. So, I mean, the term cloud is a, a lousy term, but it's one that's already used. You know, we don't just compute when we use the, a computer. We're doing lots of other things besides computing. So it's, we're just making do with the terms that are laying around. But, but to, to answer your, your, your question about if are all these things going to have their own clouds, that's the way we're talking about them now, that every, every single thing has a collection of data and has logic that can be executed on it. And it can be all the usual logic if, then, or else, nor. So, like, if, I've, if I'm using my Fitbit, and I'm using my Nike, and I'm using my Moves, and, um, and I'm, you know, my heart rate goes up to a certain amount, then tell my doctor. And that's programmable. And where the data lives is, a, is almost irrelevant. What matters is that you have control. That's the main thing. It's a, think of the cloud, the personal cloud, as a zone of control. Okay. Kind of like your house is a zone of control. 
right? And you have things in it, and they have characteristics of their own, and and those are data now. They're not just you know, it's your refrigerator. You can put one of these on your refrigerator, and you know, or your 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 oven or something like that, and you can keep track of whatever you want with it. But it's you know, it's 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 wide open. Basically, it, it turns into like an erector set. Everything that you have. Okay, so and so long as I buy products that have signed up to an open protocol that stores that cloud stuff in in, a, in an accessible place that I then have the right to join up in whatever way I want. Yeah, it basically joins so up. So an, an important thing about it is that the like right now the clouds that you saw that I when you when you scan my camera, that's in a cloud that's hosted by Kinetics by this company, but it. They design it in such a way that it doesn't have to be there. I can put it anywhere I want. Just like I could take my data and I can have it on my computer, or I can have it on a, on, a, on a removable drive, or I can put it on another computer. It's all portable, and I'm not locked in. The main thing is no lock-in. One of the most amazing things to me about, you know, having been around this business for 30, 40 years is that business still believes in lock-in. It's insane because what I'm trying to get across is that there's so much proof that not locking people in is far more productive than locking them in. Have we killed enough time? Is it dead? Give us, give us, a, give us a sign for stretching. <laughs> I'm not Italian, so I can't sing. <laughs> yeah. Now, we, we were uh, talking on the table to, uh, to see if we understood in the right way. So what you are talking about is something to... Um, uh, just, just to make an example, in the beginning of the, this uh, um, 2000, uh, some companies, also ours, has to deal with the, the request on internet data from the uh, authorities in case of inquiries. Mm -hmm. So we have to develop a lot of systems uh, for only one uh, uh, asking person. Are you uh, thinking of a world in which each individual owns his own data and ask to all the companies to give him the yep. data of his... Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Th this I, is a complete, yeah. enormous shift of paradigm. Yep. And it's just as big a shift as, as personal computing. <laughs> so, so I was understanding correctly. Yes, that's it. I, okay. I, I'm saying we're going to have a shift around data, just like we had a shift around networking, just like we had a shift around personal computing. and. It's not going back. And right now, it, because all of this is a B2B conversation between big companies, and because so much marketing money is being spent, um, uh, you know, right now the IT manager has less to spend than the chief marketing officer. And the chief marketing officer didn't even exist 10 years ago. And it's all because big companies are selling big data solutions that are going to tell you, we know you so well, We're, we know what you're going to do next. And it's absolute BS. It's just not true. We've all seen this. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, Ewan was just sharing with me, you know, an ad he got on Facebook, you know, that assumes he's a philanderer, and it's, I get these all the time, too. They, they supposedly know me. I've got 900 friends. I've been married for 20-some years. And they're, and they're telling me, you know, well, geez, you want to cheat on your wife, don't you? Yeah, right, right. I mean, that's Facebook talking to me now. It's insane. You know, and they're supposed to know me so well. They're supposed to be secure. Come on. It's, you know, they're... It's, but we're still, we don't have the, alter, the alternatives aren't obvious yet. They will be, you know, and so I'm, what I'm saying is kind of watch this space. complete shift of paradigm from uh, yeah. several point of views, not only yeah. technological, but yeah. cultural. It's going to be very first. hard. It's going to be very hard and it's going to be very useful. So, we're there, these, these guys are pointing back and forth. Another question. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, something that I, I'm not sure I understand about uh, the last part, the cloud, when you compare it to computing, for example. You say uh, personal computing became uh, uh, widespread available, and you had people who could do their personal computing, and they didn't even need to say, don't enter my PC, because it was disconnected. But they were also doing personal computing at work instead of doing on a mainframe, doing at work with a PC from the company. Where is the parallel to this 
in in uh, big data and person in in big data and, and personal. You, you data. say where, where, where's the division point or what? No, what? because it, you're, 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 you've been talking about what you do with your personal data yeah. compared with the company data. Mm -hmm. But will will there be also the equivalent to the PC at work for for big data? Well, it, 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 the hard thing with data is that data in the words of one of the VRM developers, wants to effervesce. It wants to duplicate. Yeah, Kevin Kelly says the internet is a copy machine. If you send me an email, we both have it now. And whose is it? Is it mine? Is it yours? The, what I'm suggesting is that it will become obvious where the best places are to do things with data. So for personal data, truly personal data, the things I own, my health data, my financial data, the, all that kind of stuff, um, what I want to buy, what I already own, this is, this is mine. I mean, it, there's, no, there's no company that's going to know more or better what to do with that. Now, the, the, you know, there are in companies, there are trade secrets, there are lots of things that should remain secret within a company. They're, they're, you know, and, and, but I think that the, what we're talking about here is where is code best executed? Where is who should, where should the responsibilities be for doing different things? Right now, with big data and the cloud, there's almost no imagination on the part of the big companies about what an individual can do. It's like, hi, I'm Fitbit, and I'm going to show you all the stuff I have on you. Isn't this great? And this is just like it was in 1978 with a personal, you know, your, your Radio Shack personal computer couldn't run your Apple programs, which couldn't run the Atari programs. It's the same thing all over again. Um, you know, if you worked in a company in 1994, it had email. That email would not work at some other company. You know, remember when we had all the um, uh, online services, CompuServe and AOL and Prodigy and all of those, none of them got along. All of them wanted to be the internet. And only the internet can be the internet. Even Facebook can't be the internet. That's why Facebook is flawed, and that's why you know we have all the problems with it that we do. And we. Okay. What's? You ready? Yes. Good. Thank uh, you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Doug.